Hey, last time we were talking about <clears throat> atomic weapons. I told you that there were several sites around the world where we have, I say we, we human beings, archaeologists primarily, have discovered sites where nuclear weapons have been exploded. Now, if you were traveling around in the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union, you'd find places where they have detonated nuclear devices. And where they detonate those nuclear devices above ground, the heat is so intense that it melts the sand and turns it to glass. Now, we know in modern times that the first atomic bomb exploded was in 1945 here in the United States, down a place called Alamogordo, New Mexico. And where that first bomb went off, down on the ground, you'll, you'll see the sand fused into glass. And so when we see that, we know from looking at it, wow, there was a nuclear weapon went off here. All right, now, if we were to find those same puddles of glass in other locations in the world, what would we think about that? Well, it would tell you that if you could find the same thing someplace else, somebody else torched off a nuclear weapon. Now, if you found that in, in Australia, you'd say, well, is it these aborigines that were setting off nuclear weapons? I mean, people that are still eating insects, for crying out loud, running around in loincloths? I don't think that the aborigine people in Australia or the the Stone Age people in Borneo or, or New Guinea have that kind of technology or have had it in the recent past. Especially when we go back in sites and in places where we can be reasonably certain that we can date this for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Now, I want you to notice that the dates in this book don't go back here millions and millions of years. It's going back a few thousand years. Furthermore, in the book, he points out that 3,000 years ago, five or six civilizations sprout up simultaneously. The Mayas, the Aztecs, the Incas, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, all of these civilizations all appear around 3,000 B.C. And they've got metallurgy. They've got technology. They've got aluminum. They've got metallurgy. In fact, they've got astronomy. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about astronomy, uh, I'll show you how dumb I am. I look up in the sky and I see stars. Somebody says, can you see the Big Dipper? And I look up there and I say, no. I mean, I don't see anything up there but stars. And somebody says, well, you know, look where I'm pointing. And he points up there. And they say, that's the Big Dipper. And then look over there. See, there's the Little Dipper. You really got to stretch your imagination to put a bunch of stars together and call it Dipper. You know? It's a group of stars. And I guess if you stretch your imagination, you can call that the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. That's about what I can see. I can't predict when the equinox is going to occur. I've got to go to Hallmark. I've got to go to my calendar over here. I've got to go get the Farmer's Almanac to tell me when the moon's going to come up full. Ancient people is in China and Babylon and Assyria and so on in Egypt, they were able to do that thousands of years ago. I don't know about people that stick bones through their nose. Can they predict eclipses? I can't predict an eclipse. So the people who can do that today, we call them astronomers and we say, wow, those people are pretty smart. They need telescopes so that they can look up in the sky. They have to be able to look at the relative positions and the relative times of days and nights and then observe that, write it down, and then come up to a conclusion that we can predict when the next eclipse is going to occur, you know, an eclipse of the moon or some eclipse of the sun. Well, people could do that thousands of years ago. These are not people running around dragging their knuckles on the ground. And people that can stick 30 ton blocks of rock up in the air and build a place called Stonehenge, those are not savages. Those are very civilized people with an advanced technology, with mathematics. Now, these civilizations have been destroyed. You know, we mentioned this in the last program, that the Egyptians were great, and they were very very, very sophisticated, had a great civilization, but it was destroyed. What we see in Egypt today is the remnants of a great civilization, which has been overrun by a bunch of Arabs, who are virtually today, we could say, are practically uncivilized barbarians, by comparison. Nobody in Egypt today is building any great pyramids. They're not building any of these great ancient cities. They're not, they're not raising... Uh, you know, uh, great monuments and and uh, and uh, chipping away with uh, with uh, hammers and axes and and uh, tools and making these uh, hierogly- hieroglyphic inscriptions like they did thousands of years ago. 
they're, they're dirt scrabble farmers scratching out a living, doing the best they can. Those are the survivors. And what we find here is great civilizations develop great technologies, and then it's the barbarians that come in and destroy them. Take a look at what's going on in Iraq. The greatest military power in the world is being fought to a standstill by a bunch of sand jockeys that don't even have an airplane, for crying out loud. To my knowledge, the insurgents don't have a single airplane in their air force. Every politician in America is saying, we got to get out of there. The great and mighty British Empire took on the Afghanis back in the 19th century. And then the Afghanis, these, 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 these Stone Age savages, for crying out loud, threw the British out of Afghanistan. Well, they didn't exactly throw them out. They just killed enough of them. The British said, well, we've had enough, so we'll leave. Then the Russians came along. Now, the Russians, you know, were a pretty good-sized occupation force back in the 1970s. They thought, well, we'll go into Afghanistan. Now, we'll teach these Stone Age savages a thing or two. And they brought in helicopters, and they brought in, you know, jet airplanes, and they brought in their military with, with all of their sophisticated weaponry and tanks and armor and one thing and another. They were about 10 years, weren't they? About 10 years, and one day they woke up and said, okay, we've had enough. We're getting the hell out of here. Now we got the Americans over there. <laughs> got the Americans over there fighting them Afghanis. And I don't think those Afghanis over there have a helicopter, do they? I don't think they've got an airplane. I don't think they've got a helicopter. And the president the other day says, I, I don't know if it was a president or Condi or somebody, went over to Europe and said, hey, you guys ain't, no, it was Gates, the, the, the Secretary of Defense. He went over and said, hey, you Europeans ain't putting enough soldiers in the field out there. And those uh, Stone Age barbarians in Afghanistan with bones in their noses are whipping the hell out of us, and we need more troops from Europe. Now, there was a time in the past, you know, when we had great civilizations. Did these great civilizations ever develop atomic weapons? Think about that. You know, think about the Tower of Babel. Think about your college education. Think about all the books that you've read. And I'm throwing out this thought to you. I've said, do you think it's possible that the Babylonians, the Egyptians, or the Chinese may have had nuclear weapons? And, and if, you know, if you're normal, you'd say, you know, Gordon, you've slipped a cog here. You, you've just dropped off the edge of sanity. All right. <clears throat> well, let me let me give you some factors over here, some facts that maybe you've never heard. I never heard this either. But then I live in a very sanitized society. I get my news from Katie Couric, and Katie Couric gets her news from the AP, and the AP gets its information from around the world, we're told, and we're getting the straight skinny, just like the people in Russia got the straight skinny from his Vestia and Pravda. I've showed you over and over again here that our news is managed, our, our mass media is managed, and we have a political agenda, and we have a fairy tale called evolution. This is a fairy tale for adults that we've all been... We, we've all been propagandized with, and we all believe. Now, I'm not telling you what you should believe. I'm just going to give you some facts here. The book is called Dead Men's Secrets by Jonathan Gray. Let's take a look here at the use of radioactivity. Scientists have found a number of uranium deposits that appear to have been mined or depleted anciently. Uh, boys and girls, I've read about this, and you probably heard about it too. Up in Michigan, there's a number of copper mines up there that go back thousands of years. I told you that story from Barry Fell's America, B.C. Gloria Far- Farley wrote a book called In Plain Sight. And you can go up there and you can see these old mines. You can see the places where they smelted copper. These are ancient mines and ancient ruins. And they're in Michigan. They're all over the, the northern United States and southern Canada. They're there. They're not reported by the archaeologists. They, they shut up about that. They're not over here telling you that there were people over here mining copper. Who was mining the copper and where were they taking it to? It wasn't the native Indians here. And then, you see, when we get to that part of the story, they shut up. They don't tell you about that. Well, in Egypt, in the tombs of the pharaohs, the pitch used to preserve corpses contained highly radioactive substances. Did you know that? Well, I didn't either. And I'd never heard that. And I'd never never read about that. And I can readily understand why. After having watched Katie Couric and Brian Williams and the 6 o'clock news, I can understand why. That does not fit the theory of evolution. Because if you could go in here and show that we've got radioactivity. Now, radioactivity is something that's very, very modern. You know, this Madame Curie, you know, back about 1900 comes along and she discovers a thing called radium and does some experiments on uh, on, uh, radioactivity. I mean, hell, we're only talking about radioactivity in our modern technology over the last hundred years or so, kids. 
So, and, and needless to say, that if we could go back into the tombs of the, the pyramids, for crying out loud, and find radioactivity, we'd have to say, oh my God, these people must have had a technology that included uranium and radioactivity thousands of years ago. What were they using it for? What did they do with it? You know, if we can start out with radioactivity in, 19, in 1890 or 1900, and 45 years later we can torch off an atomic bomb, if people had radioactivity at the Tower of Babel, in 45 or 50 years, couldn't they develop an atomic bomb? And I'll tell you something else. I'm going to tell you a little story here. You might want to look at this, because we've got a report here from God Almighty Himself. Every once in a while, the Creator of the universe gives us a neat report. He reported this concerning the Tower of Babel. It's uh, recorded here in Genesis chapter 11. The people were building this, this, uh, this big tower over here in Iraq. We call it Iraq today. They call it Babylon in the old days. In chapter 11, it starts off, it says, The whole earth was of one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, and let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach into the heavens, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And the Eternal came down to see the city and the tower, and the children of men built it. And the Lord behold, or beheld, rather, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Did you hear that? Nothing will be restrained from them that they have imagined to do. They, that indicates technology. This tower over here that we're talking about over here, it's got something to do with technology. And the people wanted to build this, lest they be scattered upon the whole land, or scattered over the whole earth. Scattered. Not civilized or unified, but rather scattered in individual tribes. That indicates they had a worldwide civilization. That's what we have today, a worldwide civilization. And the powers that be want to unite this worldwide civilization under one government. Well, Nimrod had the whole world, the whole civilized world, united under one world government. And this is about 3,000, well, it's not 3,000, because the flood occurred about 2369 B.C. 2369 to 2368 is the year of the flood, near as I can reckon, based upon Ivan Panin's calculations. So when this guy uses the number about 3,000 years ago, after the flood, within a couple of hundred years, these people now, eight people have multiplied. How long does it take eight people to multiply? Well, I don't know how many children they had, and I don't know how, how their birth rate was, but if you take eight people, that's three women. If these three women are having a baby every two or three years, and they live for 600 years, I mean, we're talking about each one of these families over here in 100 years' time having several hundred people or several hundred babies. These people mature in about 30 years. And so, you know, you, you, you start looking at the geometric progression. It goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. By the time you multiply this 32 times, just to give you an illustration, you know, if you think that eight people can't produce a million or two or five million population in a couple, three hundred years, you haven't done your arithmetic. If you were to take one and double it to two and then take two and double it to four and four and double it to eight, and you do that 32 times, you got 40 million. If the doubling time, and we can just pick a number over here, you know, is 30 or 40 years. If we can double every 30 years, well, we can we can we can double three times in a century, six times in two centuries, you know, in about five or six centuries, we can have several million people. Now just test it, do the arithmetic, and I think you'll be amazed. It's called geometric progression. Evidently, at the Tower of Babel, we're talking about civilization. Now we're talking about maybe two, three hundred years, four hundred years after the flood, we get to the Tower of Babel. How many people are extant? Could be several hundred thousand. Could be several million. Now, with several million people spread around the world, because we have aluminum in Peru. Remember the last program? We got aluminum. Aluminum wasn't discovered until 1804. We weren't able to make aluminum until this century. For practical purposes, we were not able to make aluminum until the 20th century. Even though it had been discovered, you know, 100 years before, it was a novelty. They're, they're taking up aluminum foil in Peru. They're digging up aluminum cups in Pakistan out of burial tombs. Boys and girls, aluminum is high technology. 
All right, so now if we've got aluminum and we've got electricity, there isn't any doubt but what we got electricity. Hell, we got the batteries, for crying out loud, that came out of Babylon. We have electroplating in in metallurgy. The last program I told you about metallurgy, I don't think I got to the to the electroplating. You know, if you go into a tomb and you pull out an artifact and the artifact is uh, electroplated, you say, oh my God, these people have advanced metallurgy and they have electricity, for crying out loud. Well, how in the hell else do you get metallurgy with electroplating? And we didn't know how to do that until the last hundred years or so. And we call ourselves modern and sophisticated and advanced. So now when we talk about the use of radioactivity, the very first sentence over here, in the tombs of the pharaohs, the pitch used to preserve corpses contained high radioactive substances. The cloth used for swathing is radioactive. The burial chambers were probably full of radioactive dust. Perhaps the priests made use of this to protect the tombs from uh, desecrators, or more likely insects and bacteria. You know, those mummies last for thousands of years. you got to get rid of the bacteria. That's what we're talking about today. We want to take our hamburger, and we want to nuke it, so that we can kill all the bacteria and eliminate E. coli. I mean, we're just getting to the point where we're, you know, waking up to the fact that if you want to kill bacteria, you can do it with, with radioactivity. And now, I hadn't heard this story before. But more importantly, and the significance of this is absolutely world-shaking, uh, world, uh, researchers have recently unlocked a time capsule, a number of documents buried in incomprehensible terms until our day. When translated in the last century, they were not understood, nor could they be until modern knowledge caught up with former knowledge and then was able to recognize it. These very ancient documents contain what is now startlingly, startlingly familiar language. Their contents are very alarming. Now, here are eyewitness reports that raise the compelling question. Did nuclear war wipe out sections of the civilized world in the third millennium B.C.? In ancient documents in India, dated back to 2449 B.C., an Indian text recounts in detail how aircraft were used to launch a weapon that devastated three cities. The record is unnervingly similar to an eyewitness report of an atomic bomb explosion because it describes the brightness of the blast, the column of smoke rising from the blast, the fallout from the blast, intense shock waves and heat waves, the appearance of the victims, and the effects of radiation poisoning. Now there's a document that is in our hands today from India describing the brightness of the blast, the column of rising smoke, the fallout, the intense shock waves and heat waves, the appearance of the victims, and the effects of the radiation poisoning. Who in the hell could have understood that document a hundred years ago? Not until we actually saw a nuclear explosion could we have comprehended what this is talking about. Furthermore, the historical text states that an iron thunderbolt contained the power of the universe. An incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose in all of its splendor. Clouds roared upward. Blood-colored clouds swept down onto the earth. Fierce winds began to blow. Elephants miles away were knocked off their feet. The earth shook, scorched by the terrible violent heat of this weapon. Corpses were so burnt that they were no longer recognizable. Hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without cause. Birds were turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. Thousands of war vehicles fell down on all sides. Thousands of corpses burnt to ashes. Never before have we seen such an awful weapon, and never before have we heard of such a weapon. The war zone was the upper regions of the Ganges and passages from this ancient Sanskrit text, which is called the, and I can't pronounce this word, but I'll spell it for you, Maha, Mahabharata, Mahabharata, M-A-H-A-B-H-A-R-A-T-A, are a nerve chiller, and the cold terror of the survivor still lives in its pages. So until we started to experiment with radioactive substances, no person on earth could have described radiation sickness for the simple reason that such a disease did not exist. And yet radiation sickness in clinical detail is being described here. The hair loss, vomiting, weakness, and eventual death. Classic symptoms of radiation poisoning. And more significantly, it states that one could save himself by removing all metal from his person and immersing himself in the water of rivers. The reason can only be in order to wash away contaminated particles. The exact procedure that we follow today when we're uh, submitted to or subjected to uh, radiation fallout. 
So, in uh, in uh, Babylonia, the Gilgamesh epic recounts a day when the heavens cried out, the earth bellowed an answer, lightning flashed forth, fire flamed upwards, it rained down death. The brightness vanished, the fire was extinguished, everyone who was struck by the lightning was turned to ashes. In Tibet, and in the Gobi, and in Mongolia. The Tibetan stanzas of Dzyan Dzyan, depict a holocaust engulfing two warring nations who engaged in aerial warfare, utilizing blinding rays, spheres of flame, shining darts, and lightning. The nations were the dark-faced and the yellow-faced, the Mongolians of the Gobi civilization. A few of the yellow-faced escaped the flooding and nuclear destruction, but the dark-faced appeared to have been annihilated. The straight eye people of Europe and the Middle East were among the survivors, apparently having been also involved in this nuclear conflict. Mexico. Uh, ancient Mayan texts describe the destructive effects, unfortunately quite recognizable to us after Hiroshima, of a fire from the sky that put out eyes and decomposed flesh and entrails. Great cities to the north, for example, in the USA, were destroyed. Canada. Uh, Canadian Indians speak of men who flew upon the skies and had shining cities and grand homes to the south. Then an enemy nation came, and there was terrible destruction. All life in the cities was gone. Nothing but silence remained. The Hopi Indians in the southwestern United States recount that some of these of the third world flew in a great city, or to a great city, attacked it, and returned so quickly that the inhabitants did not know where their attackers came from. Soon many nations flew to attack one another. So corruption and destruction came. Physical evidence. In Gabon, West Africa, there are remains of a prehistoric nuclear chain reaction that cannot be explained by natural means. Discovered down a mine, the remains appear to be residue from an artificially produced pre-flood nuclear reaction. India. There are Indian remains which strongly suggest that an atomic war was waged in the distant past precisely in the region specified in the old re- uh, records. That is, between the Ganges and the um, Rajamahal, R-A-J-A-M-A-H-A-L, Rajamahal Mountains, there are numerous charred ruins which have yet to be explored. Indications are that these ruins were not burned by ordinary fire. In many instances, they appear as huge masses fused together with deeply pitted surfaces like tin struck by a stream of molten steel. Further south, in jungle-claimed areas of the Deccan, are more such ruins. The walls have been glazed, corroded, and split by tremendous heat. In some buildings, even the surfaces of the stone furniture have been vitrified, that is, melted and then crystallized. In the same region, a human skeleton was found with radioactivity 50 times that of the surrounding uh, normal level. Now, no natural burning flame or volcanic eruption could have produced such intense heat, or the heat intense enough for this. The heat of millions of degrees, that of thermonuclear reactions, is necessary. And so I'm telling you about uh, the nuclear bomb war in ancient times. Now, it sounds kind of preposterous, but like I said before, let's, let's think about it. And you go down here to Alamogordo, New Mexico, where they set off the first atomic bomb, and you look at the ground, and you're going to see a great big pool of glass there. Now, based upon history and based upon what we know and the records, we can we can all see that this is the result of tremendous heat from a nuclear weapon which explodes and melts the sand together and forms glass. So when you see that someplace else in the world, then that ought to tell you a little something about, oh, well, that looks kind of like nuclear activity here. And when you... When you uh, take a look in the tombs of the Egyptians and you find radioactivity. Now, I never heard that reported before. Because radioactivity was first discovered by a lady by the name of Madame Curie. She may not have been the very first one, but she was right in there. And she did a lot of experiments with radium and radiation, one thing and another. And so the science got launched around 1900 by Madame Curie, on round numbers. In less than 50 years from 1900, we got a nuclear weapon. 45 years later, we got a nuclear weapon. Now, if the Egyptians had radiation, if they had radioactive elements, it shouldn't have taken them more than 50 or 75 or 100 years, you know, give them a little time, to develop a nuclear weapon. 
Now, right away, somebody's going to say, well, you know, there'd be records of it. There were, and they were destroyed by a number of events, like the Library of Alexandria. I reported that to you last time. And, and the great libraries around the world have been destroyed by the barbarians. And I want to point out that these great civilizations, like the United States of America, the British Empire, has collapsed in front of your eyeballs. America is about to go next. We are already being overrun by barbarians in Afghanistan and Iraq. We've got the most sophisticated weapons that money can buy in Iran. Or excuse me, in Iraq. Iran will be next. Just stand by for the encore. And then here are these, these barbarians running around out here in the desert, for crying out loud, fought us to a standstill, and we got a helicopter. And they're about to defeat us. <clears throat> so, you know, you can sit there with all your nuclear weapons. <laughs> That's what the hell good, are they? The great Roman Empire was overrun by the barbarians. They weren't destroyed by some technologically superior force from China or someplace. They were destroyed by a bunch of loincloth barbarians. <laughs> that's, a, that's what's happening in America. We're, we're not being destroyed over here. We're being destroyed on the other side of the world. Now our, our, our economy is about to collapse, and America will go the way of the Egyptians and the Romans and the Greeks and the Babylonians and the Syrians and everybody else that's ever gone before us. We haven't learned anything from the histories of the past, and there isn't any reason why our future won't be just about the same as the great civilizations of the past. Now, over in Pakistan, skeletons in the Mahenjo Daro, that's spelled M O H E N J O hyphen D A R O. Now, if you're a Pakistani and I, and I murdered that pronunciation, bear with me. You know, I'm a, I've been dumbed down by my public schools. And Harappa, H A R A P P A, are extremely radioactive. All right, now hang on here, kids. We go over to Pakistan and we find skeletons, and they're extremely radioactive. Where in the hell did the radiation come from? All right, now listen to this. The ruins of these ancient Indus Valley cities are immense. They are thought to have contained well over a million people each. Practically nothing is known of their histories, except that both were destroyed suddenly. In the Mohenjo-Daro, in an epicenter 150 feet wide, everything was crystallized, fused or melted. 180 feet from the center, the bricks are melted on one side, indicating a blast. Ancient Indian texts speak of a city's people being given seven days to get out, a clear warning of total destruction. Excavations down to the street level revealed 44 scattered skeletons, as if doom had come so suddenly they could not get into their houses. All the skeletons were flattened to the ground. A father, mother, and child were found flattened in the street, face down and still holding hands. The skeletons, after thousands of years, are still among the most radioactive that have ever been found, on a par with those of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And when did you hear about that when you went to college? I didn't either. I didn't go to college, but you'd have thought that that should have been reported, you know, in National Geographic, or Reader's Digest, or on the History Channel, or on Discovery. Now, once in a while, I can't find too much fault with History and Discovery. Once in a while, they'll put on one of these kinds of exposés, and then they just kind of back off and say, well, it's one of those unexplained mysteries they'll just have to look into in the future. And then they go on to something else. And then there's one, and then you'll hear another one, and then there's another one. And they're so disconnected that you can never connect the dots. You, you never put this together. I never heard about these, these radioactive skeletons. Hell, if they're radioactive, that tells you somebody had radioactivity there. When was that? Did that occur sometime after Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I never heard of any bombings going on in India, have you, since World War II? All right, so we're digging this out. Archaeologists are digging these out. Now, somebody should have reported this. And indeed, somebody did. And then somebody buried the report. That's the thing that is so <laughs> that is so frustrating. And uh, kind of bends your mind around a little bit, and you say, what the hell's all on about? It doesn't fit with the theory of evolution. These are ancient cities. They go back thousands of years. If mankind had nuclear weapons, nuclear technology thousands of years ago, then he was smarter thousands of years ago and got real dumb over a long period of time and is now just recovering from his terminal dumbs. That's what, that's what it tells you. Hell, that don't fit with evolution. So it's politically incorrect. And it's academically incorrect, and we're not going to report it. So we're going to bury it. We're going to hide it. Just like that 14-foot skeleton that used to be up there in Chicago disappeared but there's more Iraq melted ruins of a Zagarat structure not far from the ancient or from ancient Babylon appears as though fire had struck the tower and split it down 
to the very foundation. Brickwork was changed to a vitrified state, completely molten. The whole ruin is like a burnt mountain. Even large boulders found in the vicinity of the ruins have been vitrified. What power could have melted the bricks? Nothing but a monster thunderbolt or an atom bomb. Now, here's something else. Did you know that when the first atomic bomb exploded in New Mexico, the desert sand turned to fused green glass? Listen, in Babylonia, in 1947, archaeologists on one site uncovered in succession a layer of agrarian culture, an older layer of herdsman culture, a still older layer of caveman culture, and then they reached another layer of fused green glass Huh? Hey, I never heard that story. If somebody would have told me 40 or 50 years ago, Hey, Gordon, did you know that over in Babylon, they found fused green glass in an archaeological ruin, just like they found at Alamogordo, New Mexico, after they set off the first nuclear weapon? I would have said, wow. That means a long time ago, someone had nuclear weapons. That means a long time ago, they must have had advanced technology. Hey, boys and girls, before you invent nuclear weapons, you gotta have some, you gotta have some, uh, civilization to go along with it for organization, political stability, electricity, and turret lays with metallurgy. I mean, that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more that goes with it. And the more advanced the civilization becomes, you know, we didn't have computers back in 1900 with which to develop skyscrapers. First of all, we had to develop the skyscrapers and the building and engineering technology with slide rules. As time progressed, we got electricity. As time progressed, the electricity turned into machine tools. As machine tools developed, we turned into greater and greater technologies like plastics. Plastics then turned into microtechnologies. Then the microtechnologies turned into uh, electronics technologies, and the electronics technologies turns into computer technologies and so on. You don't start with computers. Computers are up the food chain quite a ways. Now, they tell us that over the next 15 years, knowledge should double again. That's that's pretty darn shocking, I'd say. Now, knowledge has been accumulating pretty rapidly. Take a look back here 100 years in 1900. You know, we were pretty good guys. We had electricity, and we, we had machines, and we had streetcars, and one thing and another. Now, take a look at 100 years later. Quantum leaps forward. I mean, if you compare American civilization today with a hundred years ago, I mean, you know, it's like those poor those poor jerks back there in 1900 were running around in loincloths by comparison, with bones sticking through their nose. All right, now this picture 100 years into the future, assuming we could get another hundred years into the future, knowledge is coming to us exponentially. And we're learning more faster every day, and that's because we got better means for research, better means for developing more and more technology. All right, now lightning may occasionally fuse sand, but when it does, the fusing occurs in a distinctive root-like pattern. Only a nuclear explosion could produce an entire layer, a whole stratum of fused green glass. In the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, the desert surface of the Gobi near Lob Nor Lake is covered with vitreous sand from Red China's atomic tests. But the desert has certain areas of similar glassy sand, which have been present for thousands of years. There are ruins, almost formless, which bear the marks of blistering by enormous heat. It is indeed difficult to believe that once men lived, loved, ruled, and died here. In Israel, in 1952, archaeologists unearthed at the 16-foot level a layer of fused green glass, one quarter inch thick, and covering an area of several hundred square feet. It was made of fused quartz and similar in appearance to sand at the atomic test sites of Nevada and the Gobi. South-central Turkey. At Katul Hayuk, archaeologists came upon thick layers of burned brick at the 6A level. The blocks had been fused together by heat so intense that it had penetrated more than three feet below floor level, where it had carbonized the earth, skeletons and burial gifts that had been interred with them. The enormous heat had halted all bacterial decay. North Syria. So completely were the royal buildings burned at uh, L L L. Let me spell it for you. At A L A L A K H. If I spoke Arabic, I'd probably do better. A L A L A K H. That wall plaster was vitrified, and in some areas, basalt wall slabs had actually melted. Get that? 
Now notice that, I, that, that, that there's numerous of these locations. Pakistan, Iraq, China, the Gobi Desert, Babylonia, uh, Israel, South Central Turkey, North Syria. Let's take a look at the Southern Sahara Desert. Here's another green glass nuclear site. Albion W. Hart, an engineering graduate from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, while traversing a desert in the interior of Africa, was puzzled by a large expanse of greenish glass which covered the sands as far as he could see. Not until 50 years later, when he passed the White Sands area after the first atomic test there, did he recognize the same type of silica fusion. Egypt. Fused green glass has been found also in sites of the Old and Middle Kingdoms of Egypt. In the Lofoten Islands off Norway, Scotland, Ireland, and in the Canary Islands. Prehistoric forts and towers in Europe have had their walls vitrified and stones fused by an unknown energy source, usually along their western wall, but sometimes on the inner sides of the eastern wall as well. So intense was the heat. Many sites show melting to a depth of one foot, turned to glass. The Isle of Man, the stones of the innermost cell of a long narrow uh, barrow, rather, B-A-R-R-O-W, barrow, or borrow, near Moghold, were in like manner fused together in the Western Pacific. Similar vitrifications have been observed in the Western Pacific. In Peru, at Cuzco, an area of 18,000 square yards of mountain rock has been fused and crystallized. Likewise, a number of the dressed granite blocks of the nearby S-A-C-A-S-A-H-U-A-M-A-N Saxahuman Fortress have been vitrified through intense radiated heat. In Brazil, the ruins of uh, S-E-T-E Oh, here it is. Seven cities. I don't know why they spelled it in some other language here, but they did. The ruins of seven cities in the province of uh, Piaua P-I-A-U-I are a monstrous chaos having been melted through extremely high energies, squashed between the stone layers protrude pieces of rusting metal that have streaks like red tears down the crystallized wall surface. Here in the United States, in the western United States, ruins exist in Southern California, Colorado, Arizona, and Nevada, in which the radiated heat was so intense as to liquefy the rock surface. Between the Gila and the San Juan Rivers, A huge region is covered with remains, ruins of cities, burnt out and vitrified in part, full of fused stones and craters caused by fires, which were hot enough to liquefy the rock and metal. There are paving stones and houses torn with monstrous cracks in the center of a ruined city in Death Valley, California, with lines of streets a mile long and positions of buildings still visible stands an enormous structure on a tall rock. The southern side of the rock and building has been melted and vitrified, and in the Mojave Desert exist several circular patches of fused glass. Hey, boys and girls, we're not talking about one or two places in the world where we find this nuclear evidence. It's all over the place. It's on Easter Island. It's in the United States, the Isle of Man, the Western Pacific, Brazil, Peru, Egypt, Scotland, the Lofton Islands off Norway, Ireland, the Canary Islands, South Central Turkey, Israel, the Gobi Desert, China, Syria, the Sahara, Babylonia, Iraq, Pakistan. Come on. Africa. We're talking about a worldwide civilization, a worldwide civilization with multiple groups of people, probably nations, or at least ethnic groups who have nuclear weapons, which culminated in a nuclear war. You know, scientists, they tell us today, you know, in the event that we go into a full-fledged nuclear war, the survival survivors will be reduced to barbarians. Hell, it looks like it's already happened. At least once. And the clue comes from Genesis 11. God told us, he said, you know, nothing's going to be withheld from these people. And these people have technology. I forgot who it was now. I think it was old uh, Albert Einstein. He said, I said, I don't know what weapons will be used in the future, but I know that if nuclear weapons are used in the, in the next world war, he said, uh, he said, uh, well, I guess somebody asked him, what kind of weapons do you think are going to be used in World War Three? He said, well, 
I don't know what they're going to use in World War III, but uh, from what, what it looks like here, the weapons that will be used in World War IV are going to be uh, sticks and stones. And that's what happens. Civilizations, great technological civilizations, like the United States of America, once it's destroyed, the barbarians will come in here, they will burn the libraries. And the knowledge of computers and uh, nuclear weapons and technology as we know it today will be destroyed. If the Stone Age people of of, uh, of Borneo or New Guinea were to gain power in the United States of America, I have little doubt in my mind about the first thing they'd do if they got into the, the Smithsonian Institute or if they got into the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or any places of learning, they would burn it and destroy it. That's the history of what happened in the Roman times and in ancient times. They are the great destroyers. They are not the great civilizations. Hey, I'm out of time again, kids. We're going to have to leave it right there. We'll conclude this next time on the Law Hour and Editorial Review. But let me remind you that you're listening, or have been listening, to the Law Hour and Editorial Review, and we're sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States. We're heard worldwide over the Internet daily. And if you'd like more information about the Law School and the Law Hour, then please go to our website at georgegordon.org. Remember, the Law School offers a free four-hour introductory CD package. Be sure to order yours by calling the Law School at 417-273-4967. The Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. Hey, we're out of time. we got to leave it right there. So we'll see you back here tomorrow night, same time, same station, God willing, of course. So until then, thanks for listening, everybody, and good night, friends. All right, last time we were talking about weaponry and nuclear weapons in the pre-flood era before, that is, before Noah's flood. But after Noah's flood, there was also a post-deluge civilization that possessed nuclear weapons. And I showed you last time that there were 25 separate sites around the world, 25 sites where you find green glass, green glass, which is the aftermath of a nuclear explosion on the ground, which fuses and melts the sand in the ground and turns it into this glass. We first saw it in the modern era at Alamogordo, New Mexico. After the first atomic bomb had been detonated, they looked down at the bottom and they said, wow, look at that. It is so hot that it just melts the elements and turns it into green glass. There are 25 sites around the world where we see that, that have been discovered, probably mostly by accident. And in many places, these are ancient cities that have been uncovered by archaeologists. You don't have to have a, you don't have to have a Rhodes scholarship to figure out that, uh oh, we did not know about nuclear energy until 1945. So if there's 25 sites around the world where we find where nuclear bombs have been torched off prior to 1945. What's your conclusion? Now, on Easter Island, there's a unique wood carving. In fact, more than one. There's a number of unique wood carvings on the island. This is separate now from those big stone heads, those big stone carvings. There are wood carvings with Semitic features. Semitic. That's that's white man's features. And they show the effects of nuclear radiation on a human body, invariably representing an emaciated body with goitered glands, swollen groin, clenched mouth, wasted sunken cheeks, collapsed cervical vertebrae, and a distinct break between the lumbar and dorsal vertebrae, popped eyes, and distended stomach, all in remarkable detail. These are the unmistakable nightmare symptoms of exposure to severe dosage of nuclear radiation. Now, does this perhaps tie in with the remains of fiery destruction discovered on the island? Pioneer nuclear scientist Professor Frederick Soddy, he's a Nobel Prize winner and a discoverer of isotopes. He envisioned a past civilization which had mastered atomic energy, and he said as far back as 1909, he said, can we not read into them the prehistoric traditions, some justification for the belief that some former forgotten race of men attained not only to the knowledge that we have so recently won, but also to the power that is not yet ours? 
The specter of past atomic warfare is increasingly more tenable as new information comes to light. Whatever we choose to imagine, there's always the hard fact that there is already too much evidence from too many parts of the world to call it nonsense. It is a fact, or it couldn't turn up so often. The secret was known. Inevitably, justification was found to use it. Civilization, populations, disappeared. Now, do we see that warning today? This is the jest to end all jesting. Once more, a universal time fuse has been lighted. Now, the wisdom and the technical splendor of the antediluvian civilization was so astounding that it was never and has not been to this day equaled. Even after the deluge, the reconstituted world system was conceived by races with an intelligence far superior to our own. And there's clear evidence, literally by the tons, that it was so. In many ways, their civilization was comparable to our own. They had air travel. They had underwater devices, submarines. They were very modern. I don't think you can construct that super civilization and find exactly another United States or Russia or China. They traveled on a different orientation, whether in lighting or transport. They reached the same results by a different method. And because of the fragmentary and incomplete nature of our present knowledge concerning them, any attempt by exposition is necessarily imperfect. However, the evidence points to scientific knowledge that was worldwide and worldwide all at the same time. And it appears that work stopped on a global scale more or less overnight. Genius, perverted by a materialistic philosophy, culminated in corruption and violence. And you know the sequel. Striking parallels exist between that period and our own today. More to the point, there are some ancient biblical prophecies that foretell the appearance in the sky of blood fire and mushroom pillars of smoke to occur in that final age when man acquires the ability to destroy the earth. It is stated plainly that the world's cities will be devastated and that the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And according to this, we are heading toward that day when everything stops toward that moment when Earth's pendulum will shudder and stop in mid-swing. Now, there's something unique about Bible prophecy, and indeed, this book makes audacious claims for itself, actually challenging the world to prove whether it is a divine message to us or not, by testing its prophecies. Now, were you aware that one-third of the Bible is Bible prophecy? One-third of the entire book is dedicated to that one subject, just foretelling future events. And there's something else. It informs us that an unseen overlord has been quietly shaping human history and that he will reveal his intentions before causing certain events to transpire. Now, come to think of it, the prophecies to date have been uncannily accurate. Events leading to the 20th century have been outlined step by step in correct sequence. Then there is the current scenario, our explosion of knowledge, the awakening to strength of weak Asian nations, a militarily aggressive Russia, the 1967 return of Israel to Jerusalem, a coming economic political union of ten nations, or groups of nations in Europe. And the list goes on and on. But all of these are to occur against a background of increasing earthquakes, famines, war, and unprecedented social breakdown. Then come predictions, more startling than fiction. Soon, uncontrollable panic grips the nations as they see no way out. Then a charismatic leader, already clearly identified, arises with the solution, the Hegelian solution. For the first time since ancient Babylon, all nations are now drawn into a one-world government. An electronic network already is in place, which makes it easy, makes it possible, makes it likely. The world leader cancels the existing currencies and establishes a worldwide numbering system. Every person on earth is required to receive an imprint. Dissidents are not tolerated. For a short season, the planet is at peace. The world dictator is very popular. Now, the utter wickedness of this man is not exposed to the world until it's too late, when suddenly all hell breaks loose. World trade collapses. Religious extremism mounts. And we are plunged into a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Now, the scripture predicts that so great will be the devastation that unless the conflict is halted, 
in midstream. No life will be left on planet Earth. And it will be stopped. It'll be stopped just in time, but only because of the supernatural intervention of our Creator, live and direct, and in person. Undoubtedly, human history is racing toward some appalling catastrophe. The good news is that the Bible has clearly foreseen these events and revealed them. It does offer evidence that the Creator is still in control and will do what man cannot do. Act decisively to save the human race from total annihilation. So, who's to blame? Human perversity is the main reason for the mess that the world is in today. But you may ask, well, is it likely that an all-powerful, caring creator would allow any of his creation to go wrong? And the answer is, of course, you're witnessing it live and direct right now, today. If he decided to give men his free will, would this have happened? Well, tell me, would it be better... It would it be a better world if he had not given us free will, but instead controlled our every move like a cow chewing her cud in the field? What if we were just robots? You know, think about that. But as it is, we have freedom of choice, and we can demonstrate hatred or love, just as we prefer, just as we wish. So let's face it, if we did not have free will, then love, generosity, and other qualities would be unsatisfying, even meaningless. Life wouldn't be worth living. And as I said earlier, man has created noble or he was created noble, he has perverted his own character by misusing the free will that his creator is giving. So no, you're not in a process of evolution which will enable you to create your own paradise here on earth. Such a philosophy is dangerous. It will lull millions into being unprepared for the eventual climactic events dead ahead. And as the prophecies lead us unerringly along the trail toward Armageddon, the flood of Noah sounds a warning. The information that we've dug up concerning our past suddenly becomes relevant, very relevant, like a time bomb or a time machine ready to explode. But after D-Day, then what? For those who choose it and qualify, there's a new world, a new world order. It's coming. It's just not what President Bush had in mind. It's a world in which eternal youth, love, loving concern, and security are the norm, where transformed individuals are able to live in harmony. Now, if all of this is true, then I suppose people aplenty are going to miss out, and I wouldn't... Uh, and wouldn't some of them just love to be there? Think of it. It's a whole new world to mess up. I thought that was a pretty good epilogue. thought I'd share it with you. Now, there's one last item over here called astronomy that I thought I would point out as kind of a concluding scenario here for you to consider. Now, remember, Jonathan Gray put together 969 records from around the world that point to ancient civilization. Things such as microscopes and glasswork, geography, astronomy, cosmology, mathematics, metallurgy, large-scale construction, construction techniques, social organization and engineering, mechanical devices, everyday items, clothing, art, medicine, flight, space travel, ancient science, civilization, electricity, weaponry. I just concluded weaponry because the nuclear option is now on the table. And we're talking almost daily about, in the news, you know, daily, about Iran obtaining nuclear weapons. And President Bush says we'll never allow that to happen. Iran is now aligned with Russia and China, who have nuclear weapons. It's a Muslim country. Pakistan is a Muslim country. They have nuclear weapons. There's a big fight brewing between the Muslims and the Jews. And the Battle of Armageddon is scheduled in the Valley of Megiddo, 35 miles northwest of Jerusalem. All of the elements are in place. Now, in conclusion, let me let me take a look here at 92 records of astronomy worldwide, such as the round Earth, the Earth's diameter, and the Earth's orbit, which were all known and all recorded by ancient civilizations for us today. Think of this. As I first researched this, Earth's unmanned spacecraft Voyager 2 was hurtling beyond Uranus toward the planet Neptune for a rendezvous in 1989. On August 24th that year, yes, the exact day was known. August 24th, 1989. It was calculated to swing around past Neptune and then head off out into the solar system forever into unknown deep space. Now, was it as recently as the 19th century, just 200 years ago, that most people thought the earth that we live on was flat, that it was the center of the universe. 
surrounded by a distant vault of fixed stars, and that the planets and the sun moved around us? You know, that's right. The earth cannot be a ball, said one prominent scientist of the time. Otherwise, the people on the lower half would fall off into the void. Even the great Kepler, not so much earlier, had said that there were only 1,005 stars. So long did ignorance prevail that we assume that ignorance has always been the norm. Now enjoy a taste of a great surprise. Contrary to history as we know it, as we learned it in college and high school, in that remote period that we call prehistory, there existed an embarrassing wealth of astronomical knowledge. And may I suggest that the more that one looks into it, the more you will feel that a race of scientific giants has preceded us. Now, that conclusion is unavoidable, that the astronomers of Babylon, India, and Egypt either possessed sophisticated instruments themselves, such as telescopes, or they were the custodians of a prehistoric science that came from a mother civilization and was passed down to them. Even later, among the classical Greeks, the Romans, there were sages who still had access to a body of knowledge extending back into the dim past. The nations with particular knowledge cited below were not alone in possessing this knowledge. This science must have been universal at first, but remember the surviving evidence is fragmentary. So let's take a look at the earth itself. In Egypt, China, England, Guatemala, Bolivia, Greece, India, Samaria, Babylon, Assyria, the Hittites, Asia Minor, and from the Bible all reveal that the earth is round, that the earth is a sphere surrounded by the heavens. The Sumerians, for example, identified, named, and grouped the constellations of both the northern and the southern hemisphere to the south pole. For example, the complete skies of a global, not a flat earth. Egypt's pyramid builders could project maps from spherical to flat surfaces which shows that they knew that the earth was round, and they calculated the shape and the size of the earth far more accurately than anybody before the mid-19th century. Now in China and Greece, the earth is slightly egg or pear-shaped, and modern science agrees. Our distorted sphere is a little bit pear-shaped, with a bulge in the southern hemisphere and that was known in China and Greece. Now, in India, China, Greece, Rome, and from the Bible, we learn that the earth floats in space. From Egypt, Greece, China, India, and the Bible, we learn that the earth spins on its axis in 24 hours. The circuit of the earth, that is, the earth in its courses, the, the seeming rotation of the stars is due to the Earth's revolving on its axis. It was well known in Greece as far back as 2000 BC. And it was recorded on Khonsu Papyrus in Egypt in 1000 BC. Now in Babylon, Egypt, India, and Greece, they all knew that the Earth revolves around the sun. That wasn't discovered until Galileo had his famous run-in with the Pope, remember? In Greece, the orbit of the Earth is elliptical, that is, oval-shaped. The Earth revolves in an oblique circle, while it rotates at the same time about its own axis. Then, in Egypt, India, Guatemala, Chaldea, England, and Greece, the size of the Earth was known. A circumference difference from our modern calculation of only 225 miles was recorded in Egypt. The diameter was computed to be 7,840 miles compared to our calculation of 7,926.7 miles. In Guatemala, the weight of the earth had been calculated. In Babylon and Egypt, the exact length of the year, with the earth's solar year of 365.2420 days. In Guatemala, whereas we know it to be, 365.24 to two days. The annual movement of the sun and moon determined to an error of less than nine seconds of an arc 
was calculated and recorded in Babylon. The exact length of the solar year, the sidereal year, and the anomalistic year seems likely to have been clearly understood in Egypt. In Greece, as early as 2000 BC, the seasons are caused by the Earth's rotation around the Sun along the elliptic. In Greece, an awareness of the torrid temperature and the frigid zones existing on our planet was well known. Now let's take a look at the Moon. In India, the distance to the Moon was calculated at 253,000 miles. By comparison, we calculate the maximum distance to the moon to be 252,710 miles. In Greece, Chaldea, India, and China, the moon's light is reflected. The moon illuminates the nights with borrowed light. In Greece, it was known that the moon circles around the earth. In England, in the Arab countries, the path of the moon is an ellipse, varying closer or farther from the earth. In England and the Arabs, the variation exists in the moon's motion, an irregularity caused by the differences in the sun's pull at various points of the moon's orbit. This was discovered only by precision instruments in the 17th century. Mexico has records of the length of the moon's cycle calculated accurately to within four ten thousandths of a day and during the lunar month the duration of the lunar month is 29.53020 days according to the Copan Maya or 29.53086 days according to the Palintcu Maya actually we calculate it today as 29 point five three zero five nine days in Greece ellipses solar ellipses it is the moon that darkens the Sun in Greece and Chaldea lunar eclipses it is the Earth's shadow that falls on the moon in Babylon and England accurate forecasting of eclipses to fractions of a second of an arc were recorded, and the present methods of calculation established in 1857 included an error of seven-tenths of a second of an arc in estimating the movement of the sun. Babylon's calculation was two-tenths of a second nearer to the truth. The maximum amplitude of the moon's wobble, which occurs immediately before the season's of lunar eclipses was observed in England as early as 2000 BC and clearly recorded. Now to predict an eclipse however three checkpoints at 120 degrees longitude distance from each other must first be established and information communicated from each of them. In England in 2000 BC there is a 56 year cycle to moon eclipse patterns. In Babylon, China, Greece, and Rome, the moon exerts an attraction on Earth's tides. Only 300 years ago, Kepler was criticized for making this same conclusion. In Greece, the moon has a two-week-long, 15 times longer than ours. That is, the moon has a two-week-long day, which is 15 times longer than ours. That was known in Greece. In China, 1700 BC, the lunar month has a precise length of 29.530516 days. Our modern calendars are only eight one hundred thousandths more accurate. Unless you would believe that you could stack up 2.3 million rocks and get it square to within plus or minus one half inch by accident. Hell, I couldn't build an outhouse by accident that close and furthermore all of the pyramids are accurate furthermore they're aligned with the astronomical signs in the universe they're they're aligned with true north they're aligned with the various planets for crying out loud planets with with orbits and with uh, with uh, with numbers that go along with them if you heard some of these numbers you know 583.82 days and, and with calculations on the moon, you know, the, out to four or five or six decimal places, for crying out loud. And these are written records. These are written records that are well known by the Smithsonian Institution. 
But they're not publishing that. They hide it and they bury it. And you ought to be asking yourself this question. Why? Charlotte Isherby wrote a book called The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. When you withhold that kind of information from people, there can only be one reason. We don't want you to know that. Why? Because we want you to remain ignorant. We have a political agenda. Here's what we want you to believe. Here's what we're going to teach you. That the pyramid was built with goat gut, but we couldn't calculate its accuracy until 1964 with a laser transit. I feel ashamed that I swallowed that line of horse pucky, but then I did. I didn't have any reason not to. Now, in Assyria, Jupiter rages like the sun. We have now found that Jupiter's interior is much hotter than had been estimated, that it spews deadly radiation out into space. Jupiter wallows in a seething mass of hydrogen and helium gas clouds forming a turbulent atmosphere, some planet. Tornadoes and cyclones whirled across its surface. Perhaps they've raged nonstop for thousands of years. So reported the Australasian Post of May 10th, 1979, Concerning Voyager Voyager 1's discovery in March of that year, the first sensation was when Voyager 1 detected and reported a blinding light above it, so strong that it appeared ten, or it appeared rather to sensors, to the even brighter, to be even brighter than the sun as seen from the Earth. It is an aurora, an aurora which engulfs the whole of Jupiter. Jupiter sends out ray particles. Jupiter is the largest producer of rays in our solar system. Now, how did the Assyrians know that? Remember, the Assyrian Empire has been destroyed, you know, for thousands of years now. And so what we dig up in Assyria or Babylon out of these archaeological digs, you know, when we find these clay tablets and so on and we decipher them, you know, we, we read what these ancients had reported, you know. Did you know that these reports even existed? Has anybody ever told you that? First time I saw, uh, you know, numbers like this is when I read this chapter on uh, the uh, secret planets are, are we in for more surprises here the astronomical evidence that these ancients in past in the past had this kind of knowledge in order to have this kind of knowledge they had to have a mount polymer sized telescope now i wouldn't be a bit surprised but what they had a hubble telescope out here in earth orbit because some of the information that's given here would indicate to me that in order for them to know this they must have been dealing with space flight and space travel in fact he's got a chapter in here on ancient science space travel and flight I haven't covered all the chapters. I, I, you know, I can't read the whole book to you here on the air, but I can review it. I can tell you the, the some of the more sensational parts of it and the details. You know, if you're interested, you have to learn for yourself. You can get a copy of this book, by the way. And if you can't find it anywhere else, let me uh, suggest that you go to www.bravenewbookstore.com. Just get on the web. It's bravenewbookstore.com. they got a phone. It's in Austin, Texas. It's 512-480-2500. That's 512-480-2503. Brave New Bookstore. The book here is published in 2004, so it's fairly recent. You should be able to get a copy of it at your local bookstore. Barnes & Noble is our local bookstore here in Springfield, and they usually carry a pretty good selection of books. And uh, so I picked it up, and I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I said, geez, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review this. This is a 1 in 100 read. I, I grade books like this. It's a 1 in 20. That is, you know, you'll read 20 books, and then you'll find a book like this. This is one of those one in 100 books. This might be a one in a 1,000 books. I'm, I'm pushing 70, and I've never read anything like it. Never seen anything like it. Didn't know it existed. I'll tell you what, what blew me away was this uh, weaponry section over here, where there are 25 sites around the world that have the green glass that is produced only by nuclear explosions, like the explosion at Alamogordo, New Mexico. And that's what blew me away. I said, oh, my God, we've already had nuclear war on this planet. We've already had nuclear war on this planet. From the, from the time that God, in the, in the antediluvian world, took a look around and he said, you know, I'm going to destroy this thing with a worldwide flood. I'm going to wipe this thing out. He said, they only think of evil continually. It describes our world today to a T. All we think about today is war and rumors of war. It's just constant evil continually on planet Earth today. We're, we're at about the same point that we were in Noah's day. And God judged the world in that time, and he's about to judge the world a second time. And he says, hey, this is coming, so pay attention, wake up, smell the coffee. And all we've done so far is give him the finger. But I would suggest that we, we think about that and say, well, uh, I'm not really sure I want to give this guy the finger anymore. It, you might not be in our best interest. 
So that's where this section is here on astronomy. There's a couple more sections in here on astronomy that... that uh, how about beyond our solar system here in China? The blue of the sky is merely an optical illusion. In Indian Greece, the universe is infinite. The distance to and between the stars is immeasurable. In Mali, the stars are much more distant than the planets. In India, Greece, and from the Bible, the stars cannot be numbered. In Greece, the stars are blazing suns like our sun, and some of them are larger than our sun. In Sumeria and Greece, each star is the center of a planetary system. On June 13, 1984, Dr. Hartmut Amon announced to the American Astronomical Society that 40 nearby stars show excess infrared emission, suggesting that they may be orbited by solid material or even planets. You know, we just have come to that understanding or that knowledge within my lifetime. And these ancient people already knew about it and wrote about it. How did they know? Where did they get the information? Six months later, Professor Donald McCarthy and Frank Lowe from the University of Arizona claim to have actually discovered a planet moving around the Van Biesbrock 8 star in the Ophicus constellation, some 21 light years. That's 125,000 billion miles from Earth. It had a mass 30 to 80 times that of our Jupiter. Credit for this first discovered planet outside our solar system was counterclaimed by Professor Robert Harrington of the Washington Naval Observatory, who said he saw the planet 18 months earlier with two other astronomers. Now, we have just recently come to the conclusion that there are planets orbiting these stars out in space. Now, that's information that was known in Sumeria and Greece at least 2,000 years ago. How did they know that? Did they have telescopes? Did they have a science, a technology, an astronomy equal to where we're at today and perhaps even farther advanced than ours today? Because much of what's reported here in the book Dead Men's Secrets, we don't have any technology to duplicate what they did back two, 3,000 years ago. Now that's a thought for you. Well, I'm about out of time again here, boys and girls, so we'll have to leave it right there. Remember, the book is called Dead Men's Secrets, Jonathan Gray. You can get them at www.teachservices.com. All right, we're about out of time, so let me remind you that you've been listening to The Law Hour, an editorial review sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Remember, The Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States and worldwide over the Internet daily. The Law School is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school. We're open to individuals, but by prearrangement. Remember, the law school offers a free four-hour introductory CD package. Be sure to order yours by calling the law school and asking for it. The number is 417-273-4967. That's area code 417-273-4967. Now, the law hour is carried worldwide over the Internet, and all of these law hour programs are archived on the Internet by title and date for your listening convenience. The Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. Air time's up. We're going to have to leave it right there. So we'll see you back here tomorrow night. Same time, same station. God willing, of course. So until then, thanks for listening, everybody. And good night, friends. 